Welcome to the Deep Dive. Get ready, because today we're kicking off something really special. It's our brand new CS Whip 3.1 exam prep series. And it's designed specifically for you as you get ready for that CS Whip 3.1 welding inspector certification. Think of this as uh, a focused session, like part of your inspector's toolkit. We're tackling multi-choice questions today, yes, but we're using them to really understand destructive testing and weld imperfections, you know, the new exam format. It's really about building your confidence, not just your knowledge base. That's exactly right. Look, the aim here isn't just memorizing answers for the exam. It's about getting that deeper understanding of why an answer is correct. And crucially, how that knowledge actually plays out when you're inspecting welds in the real world. We want you to grasp the practical side of things. That's what makes a really effective inspector. So yeah, let's get into it. Okay, let's do it. First up, destructive testing. These are the methods. Well, they reveal what's hidden inside the weld, right? Things you can't always see just by looking. So start with a question, one that you might actually see, designed to test how you select the right test. Here it is. Which is the best destructive test for showing lack of sidewall fusion in a 25 millimeter thickness butt weld? Options are A, Nick Brake, B, side bend, C, chirpy impact, D, face bend test. Okay, straight off, the correct answer is B, side bend. Now let's unpack the why, lack of sidewall fusion. It's a pretty critical defect. Basically, the weld metal hasn't properly bonded with the side of the joint preparation. You can picture it like a small gap, maybe even microscopic, where the weld meets the original plate material. It's a definite weak spot. And for a weld that's 25 millimeter thick, the side bend test is, well, it's uniquely suited. It stresses the entire thickness of that weld, particularly right along those fusion lines. You cut a specimen from the weld and you bend it so the side face is stretched. If there's any lack of fusion there at the side wall, it's put under maximum stress, maximum tension, and that forces those unfused areas to actually open up. They become visible on the bent surface. It's literally designed to reveal that specific flaw. Right, so it really targets that potential failure point. Makes sense. But what about the others? Why aren't Nick Brake or Charpy or Face Bend as good for this problem at this thickness? Good question. Because knowing why other tests don't work is just as important. Let's take a Nick Brake. You notch the weld, then break it open to see the inside. It's great for finding bigger internal stuff like uh, large pores, big bits of slag, maybe really bad incomplete penetration, you see the fracture face, but it's less reliable for consistently showing that sort of linear, subtle lack of sidewall fusion, especially in thicker material. The break might just miss it, it's not guaranteed. Then you've got C chirpy impact, totally different purpose. Chirpy measures toughness, how much energy the material absorbs before it fractures, often at low temperatures. You have a pendulum hitting a notch sample. It gives you a number, an energy value, essential for things like low temp service, but it won't visually show you lack of fusion. It's quantitative, not visual inspection for that defect. And D, face bend test. That one's good for checking ductility near the surface, finding defects near the weld face. But for a thick weld, like our 25 millimeter example, it doesn't stress the whole sidewall fusion line as effectively as a side bend does. The main stress is on the face. So yeah, for lack of sidewall fusion in a thick butt weld, side bend is definitely the go-to. Okay, that's really clear. It's about using the right tools for the specific job, the right lens to see the right flaw. So following on from that, we know the side bend test is best here. Let's think about the kind of information it gives us. With reference to the previous question and the correct answer, what type of test is this? Options A, qualitative, B, tentative, C, quantitative, D, sensitive. Right, the answer here is A, qualitative. And this distinction, qualitative versus quantitative, it's fundamental for inspectors. Basically, tests fall into these two camps based on the data they produce. A qualitative test tells you about the presence or absence of something or the nature, the quality of the material. It's descriptive. Think pass-fail based on what you see. The side bend is exactly this. You bend it, you look at it. Are there cracks, separations, unfused bits? You're not getting a number, like a strength value in Impali or an energy value in joules. You're assessing if the weld quality is okay based on visual evidence. How did it bend or the defects? It's about the quality. Whereas a quantitative test, like option C, that gives you a number. A measurement, like a tensile test, gives you tensile strength and figures. A charpy test gives you joules absorbed. Those are numbers you compare to a standard. The side bend test. It's a visual assessment of integrity and ductility that's inherently qualitative. Got it. So qualitative is more about the what or if is the defect there, what does it look like? Quantitative is the how much, how strong, how tough. That difference really shapes how you interpret the results. Okay, let's switch focus slightly now to weld imperfections themselves, specifically undercut in fillet welds. This comes up a lot. Here's the question. 
Which of the following would be cause for rejection by most fabrication standards when inspecting fillet welds with undercut, even a small amount of options? A, depth, B, length, C, with D, sharpness. The really critical one here, the one that often triggers rejection, even if it's small, is D sharpness. First, what is undercut? It's that little groove melted into the base metal right next to the weld toe, sometimes the root, and it's left unfilled by weld metal, like a tiny trench alongside the bead. Now, depth and length, yes, yeah, standards usually have limits for those, but the sharpness of that groove, even if it's shallow, that's often the biggest worry. Why? Because a sharp notch acts as a stress concentrator. Think about it, any stress applied to that joint gets massively amplified right at that sharp corner. It focuses the stress intensely at that one point. And that concentration can seriously hammer the fatigue strength of the weld. A shallow but sharp undercut can be much worse under cyclic loads, like vibrations, than a deeper but more rounded one. That sharp corner is just the perfect place for a crack to start. And once a crack starts, it can grow, potentially leading to failure. So standards are really tough on sharp undercuts because they represent a disproportionately high risk. Sharpness is often the defining factor for rejection, more so than just size alone. That's a key point. It's the geometry, that sharp notch effect, being more critical than just the volume of the defect. Okay, so if sharpness is the danger, let's think about what causes it in the first place. Quote, with reference to the previous question, what would be the most likely cause of undercut? Your options are A, high inductance, B, high wire feed speed, C, low inductance, D, low voltage. The most likely culprit here is B, high wire feed speed. There's a very direct link you see in practice. If your wire feed speed is too high, say in MIG or MAG welding, it bumps up the welding current. And if that current gets too high for your travel speed and voltage settings, the arc becomes too, well, aggressive, too focused, too much energy in one spot. This intense arc digs into the base metal beside the weld toe. It essentially gouges out a groove faster than the molten weld pool can fill it back in. So when it solidifies, you're left with that undercut groove. It's like the heat source is moving too fast or is too intense, scooping out material. Yeah, other things like wrong torch angle can contribute. Maybe voltage being too high spreads the arc too much. But excessive wire feed speed leading to too much current is a really common direct cause. Right, it's that balancing act against speed, current, voltage. Too much of one throws the whole thing off and creates a defect. It shows how understanding the cause helps prevent the problem, not just spot it later. Exactly. It's about being proactive. Okay, let's wrap up this deep dive. We've covered some really vital points for anyone prepping for the CS Whip 3.1 exam or just wanting to be a better inspector. We saw why the sideband test is key for lack of sidewall fusion in thicker welds, the difference between qualitative and quantitative tests. And then with imperfections, we focused on why undercut sharpness is so critical and how high wire feed speed is off of the reason behind it. Absolutely. And the main thing to take away, I think, is not just the what, but the why. Try to visualize these things. Picture the side bend opening up that lack of fusion. Imagine that sharp undercut concentrating stress. Understand how high wire feed creates that groove. Building that mental model of how welds behave, how defects form, and how tests reveal them, that's far more valuable than just memorizing facts. It helps you think on your feet in a real inspection. Well said. And to leave you with something to think about as you continue preparing, here's a final thought. How might understanding these specific test outcomes and the root causes of these imperfections we discussed today actually change how you approach your next hands-on welding inspection? Think about how this deeper insight moves you beyond just following a checklist and towards becoming a truly insightful problem solver in the field. Keep digging deep.